Thank you very much. Good morning. Yes, I am Quentin Cooper, tweeting as at QWERTY, uh, your genial host. So welcome, welcome, welcome to the first of three FameLab International semi-finals, which, strictly speaking, makes them tremi finals as there's three of them, although not that strictly because there's no such word as tremi, except in Slovenian, where it does exist and does mean three. So in this Olympic summer, this is the one event at Cheltenham Science Festival, possibly anywhere in the world, that combines the marathon and the sprint. For our 27 Tremi finalists, it's a sprint. They've got exactly three minutes to get across something of the magnificence and significance of science, the wow and the how to amaze and amuse, to give you something of the reasoning and the resonance. For the host, that's me, and possibly for some of you, it's a marathon. Three Tremi finals back to back means we will not be done until gone 6 p.m. That is seven hours from now. You could walk a marathon in that time. You, you could fly twice. Well, walk it twice, that's really impressive. Yeah, you could, uh, yeah, you could, you could fly to most but not all of the countries taking part. So it's a long day. I just have interest, who is planning to be here? Can I get the lights up for a second? Who is planning to be here for the long haul? Let's see your hands. Oh, let's just see how many of you are still here at the end, shall we? Let's just see. And while we're doing questions, any, anyone who's just wandered into this and never really encountered FameLab before? There's a couple of you. Okay, well, good welcome. I should explain you've not joined some weird cult. I like it. Applause! We've got strangers in the house. No, it's not quite that bad. Okay, so this is the world's largest science communication competition. Uh, with the help of the British Council, it has spread across every continent, dozens of countries. Each of them has national finals, and the winners of those national finals, or in one exceptional exception, the runner-up, get to come to Cheltenham to be here. Um, and a part of the... It's a great prize, and bear in mind what you're going to see from them is not just... 180 seconds of brilliant communication, but 180 seconds of brilliance often in their second, sometimes their third language. That is kind of all you need to know. The rest you'll pick up as you go along. The only other thing is that you get to play a part as the audience because you get to vote and send one of these people you're about to see through to tomorrow night's final. I'll explain how you do that later. Uh, it's not all down to you, though. We also have three judges who get two to three minutes each for questions after each fame labber. Uh, vote goes to small child as well. You get to vote, don't worry, as well. Uh, they'll choose three from the nine who get to be in the final. Exactly what I was going to say. If they're, <laughs> if they're three, if the one that you, the audience, choose happens to be the same as one of their three, so be it. If you happen to choose somebody different, then four go through to the final. It's entirely logical, yet overly complex. That's the FameLab way. So who are these judges, you ask yourselves? Only some of the very finest minds available at Cheltenham Science Festival at 11 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Please welcome, first of all, our chair, geneticist, biotechnologist, encourager of collaborative research, enhancer of scientific diplomacy, and now science attaché to the British ambassador in Israel, Ronnie Prower. Next, zoologist, writer, blogger, broadcaster, author of Sex on Earth and Death on Earth. I prefer sex, given the choice, which isn't often. And described by National Geographic as refreshingly self-aware, Jules Howard. <laughs> and thirdly, formerly research fellow in infectious disease modelling at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And she's now their public engagement coordinator, organizing everything from festivals to their Young Scientists program. Applause, please, for Erin Lafferty. <laughs> so, Ronnie, I've cunningly avoided saying very much about the rules or the judging criteria. Can you just, for those who aren't new to this, just sprint through what the key things you'll be looking for from our fame lovers? Perfect. So, <coughs> we uh, were just saying that diamonds are judged on four Cs, but fame lovers are judged on only three, which is good, because there's less for me to remember. 
Um, we're looking, going to look at content, so what they talk about and uh, whether it's, you know, sort of factually accurate. You can't make stuff up, apparently. And uh, we're going to look It's a science thing. Yeah, Making yeah. things up kind of frowned on. Yeah. Yes, yes. Um, also, we're going to look at clarity, so the extent to which we understand what they're trying to tell us, the extent to which we feel like we can walk out of the room and explain the same concept again to someone else. And the third one is uh, charisma. So we're kind of looking for that person who, when the little squeaky toy says that they've been speaking for three minutes and they need to stop, we kind of do a little, oh. So, oh um, Max, British Council, demonstrate the squeaky toy. <laughs> wow. So that's if they go over the three minutes, the squeak of death, okay? <laughs> right, so it's ability to survive the squeaky toy. Yes, and so, uh, yeah, I think you said it best, their ability to amaze and amuse. We're here to be both of those. Brilliant, great, so we're in for some amazement and we're in for some amusement. And Erin, as I've sort of already mentioned, a lot of these people have got this far not having to talk in English. They've talked in their own native language, or maybe a second language, and here they might be talking second or third language. How on earth do you make an even judgment across nine people where some of them are comfortably in their mother tongue and others are a couple of steps removed? I think that regardless of language, when it comes to someone who has true passion and knowledge and, and an ability to really communicate, that the language doesn't matter, and it, it will always come through. Oh, nice line. And finally, Jules, all these people have come here to represent their countries, their champions, you're going to turn two-thirds of them into losers. How do you feel about that? <laughs> <laughs> You've got me pinned down as like the nasty <laughs> jokes already. I mean, uh, <laughs> Collectively. Well, they, you know, these, these guys, this is, I mean, it's a massive, amazing achievement, really, to kind of, to have made it this far and to be representing nations is incredible for anyone. So, I mean, genuinely, there, there are no losers. And I think it's just wonderful to just get a chance to, you know, like you guys, just be pulled into other people's worlds and be inspired by their kind of interests. So they're all winners. We're all lovely. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> in a way, you're all winners. But in a real way, by tomorrow night, only one person <laughs> will be. Okay. okay. I, it's a big responsibility, and we are very grateful. So can we have a preemptive round of applause, please, for our three judges? So just to be triply clear about the format, there are three Tremi finals, three minutes each for each final, three minutes for questions, and three judges choosing three of them to be in the final. De La Sol were definitely on to something. Now, the order for each day and for each semi Tremi final has been randomly determined by the new GCHQ supercomputer Lithgo, uh, which is just up the road. First on that random list is Italy exactly the same as last year. We may have to get Lithgow looked at, but I've been saying that for <laughs> ages. The rest of the running order, though, however, is different. Now, our 2016 Ita Italian champion is Lorenzo Pizzuti. Last year, it was Luca Perry. So not only have we got Italy twice in a row, we've got Italy and the initials LP twice in a row. Everything else, though, is different. Uh, Lorenzo is a PhD physics student in Trieste. He's at the University to Study the Universe, something he says he's been fascinated by since childhood. He's interested in its history, he's interested in its future, he's interested in its secrets. And when not contemplating the cosmos, Lorenzo is in his own parallel universe as a concert pianist. He's been performing in public for years and says it was his passion for music as much as for science which led him to enter Fame Lab. Uh, we haven't got time for a planet suite now, but he might manage a three-minute minuet. So a crescendo of applause, please, for our first FameLab Tremi finalist, Lorenzo Pizzuti. Good morning, everybody. To break the ice, I'm Iron Man. And I'm here to test my new ultra-speed suit by flying from here to the moon and back and measuring how much time it takes with my hyper-precise stopwatch. And oh, the result is amazing. I fly so fast that the entire journey lasts only five seconds. Wow. But in this room, there is also Captain America. Does anyone know Captain America? Yeah? The king of justice and other crap that wants to measure my time of flight from here to be sure that I'm not fooling you. So, when I land to show you my fantastic result, you ruin all the party screaming, oh, I knew you would fail. I measured your time and it took 15 seconds. What? 15 seconds? 10 seconds more than my measurement? It's impossible. You rock the measurement, stupid soldier. But she replies, no, no, my measurement is right. You are a liar, you are Iron Man. And so we start a civil war, an eternal debate on whose measurement is right and who is wrong. The problem, my new dear friend, is that we are both right. It's the perception of time in the system that is moving fast, me, and in the system that is at rest, with respect to me, Captain America, that are different. 
space and time, ladies and gentlemen, two entities that in our common view we consider absolute, but actually they are not. Space and time heavily depends on where we are measuring them. This is simply because they are not two ideal concepts beyond the nature and the reality itself. They are part of our universe, namely specific properties of the universe. They were born with the universe, they evolve with it, and so they assume different values in each part of it. Just like the bones inside our body, they define the inner structure of the cosmos. We can think of them as two parts of the same thing, a giant towel that fills the entire universe, that is the base of the universe, the space-time. In this towel, everywhere, space and time are completely indistinguishable from each other. We can measure space in seconds if we want, time in meters. And when we put mass or energy inside the towel, just like my face, we are simply changing its geometrical structure so that the values of space and time one measure here are completely different from the values one gets in each other point along the space-time. So that's, for example, here. But at the very end, what is the result we perceive in our common life of this theoretical deformation of space and time? Well, it's nothing but the most common, simple, naive, stupid force we deal every day of our life. Gravity. <laughs> Sorry, I don't want to. Okay. <laughs> I'm on the white cross, but they, they don't go down. No. No. Okay. no they, they're Fantastic. They're fairly stable. I understand. Okay. You're okay. safe there, Iron Man. Um, th so that was fascinating, uh, epic even. So I'm, I'm really interested in, so you describe space and time as the bones of the universe, and bones are obviously you know, something that holds a structure in place. So the idea of manipulating the fabric of space-time is something that's captured public imagination for, you know, since Star Trek, even before. Um, so I want to ask you what you think about based on your presentation, what do you think about time travel? Is it something we've completely made up or is it something that you can perceive in some, uh, with some scientific stability or credibility? Well, this is a very interesting question because, because I believe in, let's say, time travel because uh, just the possibility to manipulate time is just to go farther than an observer that is at rest. So for example, if I move, if I run, I gain in my entire life some kind of uh, one millisecond with respect to one that is in his entire life stop. So for example, run, run every day of our life, so uh, we gain uh, life, let's say, <laughs> one second of life. But the idea is that uh, when we have strong gravity, so some kind of object that is able, sorry, I take that, to we have these two points of space and time. If the gravity is so strong, it's possible that these two points are putting together. So two instants of time and space are now connected. So yes, time travel is possible. We can do time travel, I think no, because we don't have much energy and much gravity to do that. We need something that is very massive, like the so-called black hole, <coughs> something that's break the law of physics. So, but would be very nice to, to try to make a black hole in this, uh, in this earth. So we'll die, but we'll die happy, let's say. <laughs> no, no, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Lorenzo, that was great. That was really good. Um, you, quick just a quickie, just a quickie. I love that. I, I was wondering if the clothes are going to keep coming off and if the suit top was going to be a new prop. And <laughs> Not that kind of um, a show. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you said music inspired you. Does it inspire your science communication? Because I felt like we reached a bit of a crescendo there. Because I, I love to uh, talk, to stay on a stage, and to uh, express my, uh, my feeling. Because I think that scientists have also to, uh, um, have to, to express their own feelings to other people, to make other people understand why they're doing what they are doing. So I'm a scientist. I try to be a scientist because I love what I do. I have the passion to do what I do. And so I love that other people understand what we are doing. This is the concept. Sorry for my English, but I'm an Italian and I'm a physicist. So. <laughs> this is great. One more time, roar of Thank applause for Lorenzo Vincenzi. And I think Lorenzo set the tone very nicely there by evoking Captain America and Iron Man because Fame Lab is a kind of sort of civil war, very, very <laughs> civil version of it.
Now, funny story. I was in uh, Cape Town last month making a BBC World Service radio program. Uh, the Forum on the Brain Drain, still available online if you want to listen. Excellent program, great presenter. Uh, <laughs> but someone came up to me and asked if I was free the next day. And that is how I ended up hosting the South African final of Fame Lab. There is a bit more to the story than that, but suffice to say, I had a great time, met some fascinating people, and I'm delighted now to be renewing my acquaintance with the winner, uh, Nozipo Gumbi, originally from KwaZulu-Natal. Uh, Nozipo is a PhD student at the University of South Africa, working on how to use nanotechnology to make the most of one of South Africa's most precious resources, water, helping develop membranes to help purify it. After her victory in Cape Town, Nozipo tweeted, never doubt yourself. If opportunities present themselves, grab them with both hands, because you never know where they may take you. Although in this case, she does. They've taken her here to Cheltenham and to being our second Fame Lab international tremi finalists. Prepare for a crystal clear stream of consciousness from our reigning South Africa champion, Nozipo Gumbi. Thank you. Did you know that the colorless, odorless, and tasteless water that you and I are drinking each and every day may not be as clean as we thought it was? Here's why. As the machines and equipment that are used for water testing are getting more and more advanced, new types of pollutants are now being detected in our water sources. These pollutants are very small in size and are not visible to the naked eye. They are called micropollutants. Where do they come from and how do they end up in our water sources, you may ask? Well, a number of sources have been identified, but the main culprits have been pesticides, which are used in agriculture, pharmaceutical products, things like contraceptive pills, slimming pills, and a vari variety of other industrial pollutants. When we take in things like a contraceptive pill, for example, part of the pill will go into the body and it does the job that it's supposed to do, the rest is excreted out through urination. So when you flush down the toilet, the contaminated urine eventually ends up in the wastewater stream. And so the story begins. Not very long ago, a research report came out which labeled these micropollutants as gender benders. This was based on a survey that was done in fish which resided in rivers where high levels of these pollutants existed. Male fish were found to have female reproductive organs. And in some instances, the fish will show both male and female reproductive organs. Ladies and gentlemen, such issues and many other complex ones are likely to spin across the human population because we are also one of the large consumers of water. This calls for new water treatment processes to be put in place. For that reason, my research is looking into developing a new membrane filter that can be used during the final stages of water purification to ensure complete removal of these pollutants. Membrane filtration uses the same principles as the sieves that we use in our home for baking or for making tea. Now having that principle in mind, what we want to do with this filter is to make its openings even smaller than the size of these pollutants. To do that, we, use, we are planning to use nanotechnology, bring it into the mix of things and use materials that are called carbon nanotubes. <coughs> nanotechnology, this is simply the study of any material known to man, but at a very small scale, smaller, than your single strand of hair, which has been sliced into 75,000 pieces. Extremely cool things happen when materials get to that scale, ladies and gentlemen. They behave in such incredible ways. I'm talking about them being more reactive, stronger, all of these wonderful features that were not there when the material was in its bar form. I sometimes wish I could be studied at the nanoscale. I'll probably be the coolest woman in the whole wide world. Beyonce will have nothing on me. <laughs> now back to carbon nanotubes. As their name signals, they are entirely made up of carbon. They are tubular in structure, just like a drinking straw, but of interest to us in this filter is their extremely narrow pore openings. This means that they will function effectively in only allowing pure water molecules to pass through while rejecting, to the large extent, the passage of micropollutants. This is all in an effort towards providing water that is of improved quality to the consumers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So it was a really, really fascinating talk and a really, I think, important topic um, in terms of health of the environment, but also health of, health of humans as well. Um, my question is around um, interest in, in, in feasibility of this. So if, mm -hmm. you know, if your research shows that these carbon nanotubes can effectively um, 
get rid of these micro pollutants such as the contraceptives. Mm -hmm. What would be the costs of something like this for, say, a country or a city to be able to roll out effectively? Would it be feasible? Um, for now, uh, we haven't really worked out the cost, but the cost of the traditional or the currently used membrane filters, um, let's say in South Africa, for example, is quite affordable and it's, it has been impl implemented across the whole country. But what we've realized is that making these carbon nanotubes, especially the multi-walled, the ones with um, bigger sizes, is much more um, ex uh, less expensive. Um, so knowing that, we feel like if we bring them into the membranes, we can be able to slightly, um, maybe not take the prices too high, but still maintain that um, cheap price, but at the same time be able to roll them out effectively. Yeah. Hi ask another sort of feasibility type question because you're in nano, I know I can ask energy related questions. Yeah. So we all know the experience of having a sieve and putting things through it. It takes mm -hmm. a significant amount of energy to get a force through very, very small yes. holes. Yeah. Um, so if you're making the holes smaller Small. and smaller, mm -hmm. is it not gonna take us more energy to get water through these filtration systems? Um, not really um, because the structure or the way that these carbon nanotubes are inside they have what is called hydrophobic walls. So this means that they do not allow for water to stick. So water molecules just simply slip through. So with that in mind or with that advantage of them, this means that water molecules are able to just slip through them quite fast and effectively. Okay, brain power on membrane power. Another torrent of pure applause, please, for Nozico Gumby. By the way, it's almost 6,000 miles from exactly from Cape Town to Cheltenham, which makes Nozipo our furthest flung of our <laughs> Tremi finalists this time. Uh, see, already we've only had two presentations. We've already had Beyonce and Iron Man evoked. We'll have a whole celeb cast by the end here. Thirdly, we come to our reigning FameLab international champions, Switzerland. Uh, last year, Oscari Vinko, who's Finnish, uh, won the Swiss final before triumphing in the Cheltenham international finals. Now, Osama Kalef has already done half that, well, a third. Uh, he won FameLab Switzerland, but he's not Finnish. Uh, continuing a great Swiss tradition, he's also not from Switzerland. Uh, <laughs> Osama <laughs> hails from Cairo. And now just comes the small matter of following in Oscari's footsteps and winning the international final. First, though, he has to get through this. What should help him be mentally prepared is he's a neuroscience PhD student at the Brain Mind Institute at EPFL, which is the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Lausanne where he says he spends most of his time chasing elusive memory traces. He may not be a mind reader, but he is a mind leader. Go bananas for Osama Khalef! Have you ever had a very bad memory, a traumatic one, like an accident or maybe a harsh breakup, that would like to get rid of without affecting other memories we cherish? Can I see show of hands, please? Well, as expected, so many of you. So could I please ask you <laughs> to look here, and for all the others who didn't raise their hands, kindly close your eyes. But wait a minute here. Is it really possible that we can get rid of memories, or is it just a crazy notion from sci-fi movies? Well, before I answer this question, let me first take you through the process of how memory researchers, including myself, study memory. There are different types of memories, but we mostly care about emotional memories. Because simply if you combine an emotion to a memory, it burns into your brain and can literally persist with you throughout your entire life. Emotions like happiness, sadness, or maybe fear. So let's take fear as an example because it's very easy to induce in the lab. And to do so, we bring our daily collaborators, the lab animals. We bring some lab animals into a box. This box they have never been into before. So it's like a new environment for them. So as a first reflex, they like to move everywhere exploring it. But after a while, we give them a very weak electric shock in this box, that it's mild, but enough though, to make them associate that this box is harmful for them. So as every single time you put them back into the box, they refuse to move and they freeze out of fear. Great, now we have successfully created a fear memory. Is it possible that we can get rid of what we have just created? 
Well, it turns out that the only known treatment so far for fear memories is exposure-based, meaning you have to confront your fears to be able to get rid of them. And this is exactly what we do with the lab animals. So we bring them back into the box. Initially, they remember that the box is harmful and they refuse to move. But when we bring them back into the box several sessions a day for many consecutive days, the fear tends to go down, what's known as fear extinction. Unfortunately, this fear extinction training is unsuccessful if the animals are not receiving this kind of fear extinction training on a regular basis. So if they are not doing it for a period of time and then you put them back into the box, the fear resurfaces back, what's known as spontaneous recovery of the fear. But the good news here is, from our own research in the lab, we have found out that there is a drug. It's still under research, though. If the animals are taking this drug while they are doing the fear extinction training, the fear never comes back again. So in conclusion, and to come back to my first question, with this approach, we believe that it's quite possible to get rid of traumatic memories. And for all of you who've raised your hands in the beginning hoping to get rid of your own traumatic memories, don't worry at all. Soon, we will have the means to. Thank you. You had me at Men in Black. Um, <laughs> no, that was great. That was really interesting. Um, and it, there is, a, you know, naturally a sci-fi sort of element to it, which is, you know, really, really fascinating. Okay, so uh, the animals that you're working on, I assume are these rats? Uh, your your test mice. animals? They are mice. mice. Okay. So do you have concerns, or not concerns, but do you think the end game here, I'm assuming, is to, you know, replicate this as a, a, potentially as a pharmaceutical drug for human use, do you think the problem, although we're obviously very genetically related to mice and most other, you know, placental mammals, humans are much more complicated. You know, I'm going through a weird situation at the moment. Our daughter's really scared of dogs, really scared of dogs. And she's got that fear memory right in there. Um, but that memory could be more complicated. It could be because she had an experience with a dog when we weren't around. She felt alone. You know, she might have been going through a stage. She was starting school at the time. She, my point is humans are very complicated, and fear is about much more than just one single thing sometimes. So is that a concern? Do you really think this could be replicable, replicable for humans? Well, that's true. Uh, that's why we are still uh, investigating this new drug. Uh, but uh, apparently it works with, with the lab animals very well. So the drug basically uh, increases and enhances the learning curve of the animals. So we took it actually from the learning field, and we found that if a group of mice are taking this drug, they learn any task, regardless the task is, way more faster than another group that doesn't take this drug. And since extinction of fear is also a, a, a type of memory, um, it's learning how to be reassured, learning how to be safe. So it works also and increases this learning very efficiently. So uh, I'm studying what happened on the molecular level, how the drug works exactly on the molecular level. Uh, and I can, I can explain how it works. So basically in learning, we need certain set of genes that need to be made, need to be expressed in order for the learning to be uh, successful. But the problem is that the, these genes are on the DNA and the DNA is rather long, it's almost two meters long. So in order for the DNA to fit inside the nucleus, which is even smaller than a cell, it has to be really super coiled and compacted and condensed uh, over a reel, which is uh, a spherical protein called histones. And like this, it's super compressed and it fits inside the cell. But the problem is that the accessibility of these genes is no longer there. So the drug basically makes the DNA uh, <laughs> less condensed and uh, therefore the, the genes that need to be uh, expressed for learning to be efficient are accessible. Right. So no, that was brilliant, you. slightly longer than your original yeah. presentation, but it's still amazing. <laughs> One more time, please, for the incredibly memorable right. Osama Khalaf. And you've got some bonus stuff there about Jules's daughter's fear of dogs as well. <laughs> so were they a Swiss miss or a Swiss hit? Only time and our judges will tell. Three down, six to go, and we start the remainder with Romania and their FameLab 2016 winner, Vlad Padurian. Now, Vlad is a fourth-year medical student fascinated by the human brain and coordinator of the Student Circle of Neurosurgery and Neurology in Romania's second city, Cluj-Napoca, or a word similar to that in pronunciation, I forgot to check. Uh, all this, though, he says, is just my serious side. Vlad describes his favorite food as being humor, and he enjoys giving long lectures because then he says the jokes are all the more unexpected. Today, 
He only has three minutes, but I still think he'll find time to tickle a few frontal lobes. So please welcome our Romanian champion, Vlad Padurian. Uh, think of the first time you were on a plane or on a flight of any kind. Now, even if it was months or years ago, I bet you can still remember it, plus a whole bunch of details. And that's because in every new situation, a brain is much like a Dementor from Azkaban prison in Harry Potter. It tries to suck in all of the details, all of the stimuli. And as the stimuli are perceived and they reach their corresponding cerebral areas, they eventually convey into the hippocampus. Now, think of the hippocampus as the officer from the customs, and he decides whether information is worth going on for long-term memory or not, and does this by analyzing it and comparing it to similar events. Now, when the information gets its pass, the, the signals are resent from the hippocampus back to the cerebral areas for long-term potentiation. Now, long-term potentiation is nevertheless quite a good word in the game of hangman, but what does it actually mean? Well, think of London as a huge synapse, the connection between two neurons. London on one side of the Thames as one neuron, London on the other as a second neuron, and the Thames as a synaptic cleft, the space between neurons. Now, in the beginning, when London was being built, they only had a few numbers of docks along the Thames. But as industry developed and the demand to transport people and merchandise from one side to the other increased, they built a lot more docks. And that's what literally happens between neurons. When you have repetitive stimulation, they will form additional binding sites for the neurotransmitters, enabling information to travel much faster at a much higher rate in order for it to be recalled much, much easier. And this is long-term potentiation. Now, scientists haven't yet come to a consensus whether information in long-term memory is deleted after a few years of it not being recalled, or is it stored forever, but it's just hidden in a shady corner of the brain, much like a book in a library that falls behind the shelf and gets lost. Nobody knows where it is, but it's still in the library. Now, in the 1950s, Penfield, a neurosurgeon, performed a series of electrical cortical stimulations on awake patients and he would stimulate the temporal lobe, which houses the hippocampus in its depths, patients would have flashbacks of memories they had no idea they still had stored. So this leaves us in quite a mystery. Could these have been books that, one, that once fell behind the shelf and then were found again? Thank you. Um, Vlad, that was fascinating. So, you described to us the process of like uh, input, as in the hippocampus processing whether something should be stored in long-term memory or not. Yes. Um, I'm wondering if, I mean, I know that the brain is the new final frontier, but how much do we know about the process of output? How do I find the book? And, and how much does sort of the field know about how we access our long-term memory? Uh, how do we access our long-term memory? Yeah. Well, probably, I mean, I'm as curious as you are probably. So uh, the thing is, we, we do it voluntarily, but we don't, we don't really access a specific part of the brain. So memory is not like a library, even though I use that, uh, the way to describe how a book was lost. It's not like a, a, a library, you go and pick a book. Uh, memory are stored in circuits. So they're, they're, um, they, they're prone to change. Every time we recall them, they can change. So when we try to bring back a memory, we actually activate the same patterns, the same circuits, and the and the um, the memory is evoked by the by the neurons that are connecting um, other neurons in, in really large webs, roughly. Traveling <laughs> back up the Thames. <laughs> uh, so, Vlad, you use some really really great examples of um, of parts of the brain. So, the brain, like the dementors in Azkaban and in the customs officers, the hippocampus. Um, I was just wondering if you've seen uh, the recent movie Inside Out, and as someone who studies the brain, if you think that they did a, a good job representing the brain to a wider audience, uh, <laughs> and maybe what you'd improve if, what if they did What was it, Inside Out? Never heard of it. You see, I haven't seen, oh no! <laughs> <laughs> Honestly. <laughs> okay, well, I, I think I have six hours left until this is done, so I can watch it. Excellent. <laughs> okay. I recommend it. <laughs> okay.
I was just going to ask exactly the <laughs> same <laughs> question. Such a nerd. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay, so good. No right. questions. Just a take-home message of go and watch Inside Out. Okay, a bit of mania for our Romania champion, Vlad Padurian. So we're now up to Dementors, Men in Black, Beyonce, Iron Man, and a double plug for the Disney movie Inside Out. It is a great film. It is a fantastic film as well. Nine Tremi finalists. Coming up is number five, which means in about one and a half minutes' time, we'll be exactly halfway through. And taking us there is the Famelab Poland champion, Karolina Novak, a physician and PhD student in endocrinology. Karolina beat off strong opposition, including her own husband, to be crowned the winner. That must have been a fun evening at their household. <laughs> uh, he works on acoustics, so the two of them have teamed up to develop a new improved stethoscope for the 21st century. They've also teamed up to produce two children, which means that, as Carolina puts it, every day I combine academic with clinical work and motherhood. Somehow, that still leaves time for diving, hiking, roller skating, and taking part in FameLab. She answered, she told me, because I never say I cannot do it, I say I will try. She tried, she succeeded, and now she's here to try again. In pole position for the next three minutes, please welcome Carolina Novak. I will tell you about one of the most amazing multidisciplinary projects I was ever involved in. The aim of the study was to find an answer to the question, why can some marine mammals talk underwater when we can't? I work with my husband on several projects and he's also my diving partner. So an inspiration for the study was, to was a common problem we experienced during dives when we couldn't communicate efficiently underwater using you know, hand gestures alone and we started to investigate why gray seals, for example, generate a variety of sounds underwater while humans are not able to do so. Gray seals breathe air just like us and they generate sounds by exhaling. So what do they have that we don't? Sounds can be divided into two groups. Firstly, the structure-borne sounds are transmitted through solid structures, such as wood, for example. Secondly, the airborne sounds are resulting from the vibration of air, just like our voices or whistle. The vibrations of structures are transmitted as sound underwater very well, while sounds from air hardly penetrate the water. They rebound from its surface like a ball from a wall. So we thought if an airborne sound is to be heard underwater, it has to be converted into the structure-borne sound. And we asked ourselves a question. If any of the sounds generated by gray seals are airborne sounds, and what would be the best way to check? It would be to persuade the seal to breathe helium and see if it changes its voice. If yes, it is definitely an airborne sound. Unfortunately, this experiment would be very difficult to conduct, and we therefore had to try something else. We filmed and recorded sounds made by gray seals. Then we analyzed them and we tried to reconstruct the physical mechanism underlying the generation of these sounds. And we were able to develop a hypothesis. Seals have something that we don't. Due to the specific physical properties of tissues surrounding the air spaces in the gray seal's body, the airborne sound can penetrate through the water. And then we wanted to turn the theory into practice and we developed the first and the only device for divers that allows them to communicate efficiently underwater without electronics. And finally, I will tell my husband, look out, there's a shark behind you. <laughs> or maybe I won't. <laughs> Thank you very much, Carolina. Is, is this the actual um, yes, tool yes, that you've made? Yes, yes. Very cool. It's a prototype. Oh, very cool. And so, um, you know, when in some things with diving, it can become a very life or death situation. So, what, um, I guess, what sorts of, of scenarios would you see this being used in? And would it be something that a diver could actually sort of 
put on their equipment somewhere while they're still Yeah, still we can uh, attach it to our diving equipment, so it can be as in the uh, standard equipment. It's very light and it uh, takes only one uh, because nowadays we have like a full face mask um, and we can communicate with electronics, but our diving partner has to have another one, an ivory diving mask. And with this, you can have only one because you, know, you need only your, only your ears to hear what I'm saying underwater. So it would be improved safety because sometimes there are situations uh, when I couldn't explain my husband that there, he has a leak with a with regulator and I, was, I couldn't you know, explain it with it. And I would just simply say, hey, you have a leak. What does <laughs> and it we need sound to like? I mean, what does it, it's, it's absolutely amazing. So what does it sound like underwater? Does it sound like tinny and sort of like a... It sounds like I'm talking to you right now, actually. Yeah, we tested it and it's the, the sound quality is really good. It's really great. Um, I have so many questions, and Quentin's going to start edging. He does <laughs> edge <laughs> remarkably well. Um, is there a patent? And if so, what's the mechanism of this? Mechanism of this? Yeah, if you, uh, firstly, have you patented it? And if not, can yes, we Yes, it's patent pending. And so it, when you patented it, what, what, you know, the patent needs to sort of describe what mechanism you're well, using. We, so we, can you um, tell us? Like I mentioned, we developed the a hypothesis. Um, and we thought that if an airborne sound, like we talked right now, is to be heard underwater, because we can't talk underwater. You, you obviously know that when you're uh, on the swimming pool, for example. Uh, it has to be converted into the structure-borne sound. So we convert our voice to the vibrations of structure inside, and that is why it can be transmitted as sound underwater very well. So okay, it's, it's really successful. Caroline will be back in two <laughs> years' time to do the whole talk yeah. underwater. <laughs> Carolina Novak. And appropriately for a hiker, Carolina Novak is an anagram of I walk on anorak. Now we're on to the home straight, and with home advantage, we come to our Fame Lab UK winner, Kyle Evans. Uh, following in the long and glorious tradition of singing mathematicians like Tom Lehrer and, well, just Tom Lehrer, really, Kyle is a hybrid of maths teacher and musician. He teaches maths at a school in Hampshire, and he's recently released an online EP with the wonderful title, Songs Written in Head While Cycling, which he describes as five simple songs about life, etc. one country song that a guy promised me 50 quid for and never paid up. Tom says one reason he's enjoyed being part of FameLab is that unlike at some music gigs, it's nice to play to an appreciative audience. So appreciative, he ended up UK champion. But can he now go further? He's got logarithms, he's got music. Who could ask for anything more from UK champion Kyle Evans? When I first heard this little-known one-hit wonder from the late 60s sat in the back of my parents' car, I couldn't help but think, what would that look like graphically? To love someone more today than yesterday, but not as much as tomorrow. And being in primary school at the time, I was imagining something quite simple, a linear relationship, a straight line graph. Uh, now, to help you visualise this as well, I've arranged for this big screen behind me to be installed. So what I want you to do is to imagine the vertical on this to represent time. So your whole life together with a chap from this song. And the, uh, the vertical axis uh, represents love. So how much he loves you as a proportion of how much he possibly could. OK, so if we join up the two points we know about, that's this bottom corner here, the day that you met, to the top corner, top right over here, that's the end of your long and happy life together. Well, this is actually quite sad, because in a linear relationship, time and love are going up at the same rate. This means that when you're halfway through your life together, uh, he only loves you half as much as he possibly could. <laughs> that seemed quite sad to me. Um, but it gets worse, though, because uh, my dad once bought my mum a card uh, that said, I love you twice as much today as yesterday, but half as much as tomorrow. And this is terrible, because this describes an exponential relationship. Uh, where the amount of love is doubling, doubling, doubling every day. But if we work this back in the same way, uh, it means that just one day before the end of your life together, he loves you half as much as he possibly could. Uh, and a, a day before that, it's 25%. A day before that, 12.5%. You've only got to come back one week, and he loves you less than 1%. Um, <laughs> 
basically, when my dad bought my mum this card, he's promising to hold her in complete contempt for the vast majority of their life together. There's no other way to leave space for this huge hump at the end. Uh, excuse my uh, choice of words there, but... Uh, <laughs> This might seem quite silly or trivial, but I was doing mathematical modelling in the back of my parents' car, and no one had told me to. And it's a crucial part of mathematics where you take the information or the data given and you fit it gradually to the best, most appropriate model. And if you're wondering, the most appropriate model in this situation, there's a few you could go for, but maybe a logarithmic relationship, which has a steep increase at first and then is always increasing, just at a lesser and lesser rate. So, if you'll indulge me, I've got a follow-up song. Uh, I don't claim it to be equal, but uh, maybe just an extension on the idea. Baby, I love you logarithmically. Initially, I met you and we fell in love steeply. Now, every day, I love you more, though it gets harder to see. Baby, I love you logarithmically. I, do you know what? <laughs> it's quite embarrassing. We, we decided we would take it in turns to ask questions. And as the squeaker, I went, oh my God, it's me. Right, sorry. Um, so your, your background, you're a teacher, as you say. That's right. Do you uh, do this sort of stuff in front of the pupils? Do you find it engages them in the same way it might engage us? You know, you had a few people laughing. Does it, does it work with young people is what I'm asking? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'd like, I would use the ideas from pop music. I, I don't tend to get my guitar out because it gets a bit sort of David Brent. Oh, he's going to get his guitar again. But uh, <laughs> you'd use the ideas from pop music or from just anything that you can get a hook on. You know, it just gives the idea, you know, that card it's just a, it's just a nice way into you know exponential relationships or logarithmic curves rather than just an, a dry a dry starter so yeah I do um, it's, it's very interesting bringing mathematics in because often people will say or researchers will say to me I you know I work on math it's way too complicated <laughs> and the public don't understand it but I think you've done a fantastic job of showing that you can explain it really well but what do you think in your mind would be a particularly challenging concept in mathematics to try and capture? Uh, I mean, the, the, the difficulty is that is it's always the struggle between the amount of practice learning that you have to do in mathematics, you know, to reach a certain level. Because there are fascinating uh, conceptual ideas, you know, in logic, and we could have a, a brilliant session now about something like the Monty Hall problem, which everyone can get, uh, you know, can understand and have a nice argument about but to really get to the higher concept stuff you there is that that practice that repetition practice so uh, that's the eternal struggle is there's you know it's doing enough uh, of the practice of the simple stuff to get to the point where you can understand the world of maths really I love the fact he introduced the Monty Hall problem right at the end without time to explain it, but there's Absolutely. only one door open now, <laughs> and it is marked exit. Putting the tickle into mathematical, Carl Evans. <laughs> and I'm going to pinch a recent tweet from Carl for a cheap joke. He tweeted this, what did the, math what did the mathematician who forgot her dinner money do? Buy no meals. Buy no <laughs> meals. Thank you. That's a maths joke. Uh, only three participating nations in FameLab beginning with an S, and they're all in this first Tremi final. Already had South Africa and Switzerland, and now we've Spain and our Spanish conquistador, Alba Aguillon. Now, when Carl Evans won the UK final, he was lucky enough to get his prize from the CEO of Cheltenham Festivals, Louise Emerson. Pretty cool, huh? When Alba won in Madrid, Louise wasn't available, so she had to make do with getting hers from the Queen of Spain. The actual Queen of Spain. Queen Leticia has been along a few times now. Apparently rates it as one of her absolute favourite nights out. So next year, I think we should change all the FameLab logos to say by royal approval. I'm sure Her Majesty wouldn't mind. Alba herself has qualifications in marine biology and ecology and says she has two big passions, polar regions and ants. Ants being creatures found pretty much everywhere across the world, except polar regions. Alba says she decided to take part in FameLab to share her love of insects and that if she can get even one person excited about ants, that would be a victory for me. She clearly managed it in Madrid. 
Now we've upped the ant ante. Put your mandibles together and waggle your antennae for Alba Agion. What a big audience and how well organized. Each one is your own seat. Working as a team, very nice. Do you know what you're reminding me of? The ants in my lab. My master thesis was all about them, and I'm here today to tell you about the organization and intelligence. It's fascinating how ants with such a tiny brain are able to organize themselves into perfect rows without following any extractions. Way better than you who require an enumerated ticket to organize yourselves in a theater. Ants, however, they follow no rules and they have no leaders. A colony of millions of ants functions just fine with no man management at all. The queen ant does not tell the other ants what they need to do. The queen ant, she has what it takes. She's all ovaries and she dedicates her life to laying eggs. So if ants are not that intelligent and no one tells them what to do, how do they organize themselves in such an efficient way? By using pheromones to communicate by smell. If an ant finds a dead worm, she will go back to the nest, leaving a trail of pheromone that other ants can smell and can follow. Is the ax effect of ants. Well, for the British, it would be the lynx effect of ants. <laughs> if more than one ant finds a dead worm and they use different paths to get to it from the nest, the ant that uses the shortest path will be able to make more trips, laying more pheromone and attracting all the other ants. So while searching for food, no ant sees the big picture, but thanks to the communication between all of them, an intelligent behavior appears, knowing which route is the shortest path to get food. This, in science, is known as warm intelligence. Many individuals with no central control that organize themselves to produce a complex behavior. Ants have been practicing swarm intelligence for millions of years, something that is really important nowadays in science for the construction of robots or for a further understanding of how neurons organize themselves in the brain. So don't lose your tickets. You need them to know how to get back to your seats. But next time you step on an ant, remember all the things they have taught us. If you walk alone, you might get to your destination a little bit faster, but with company and communication, you will get much farther. Um, I, I definitely think you can claim victory because I'm definitely an ant convert after that. Um, <laughs> so this idea of following no rules and having no leaders and the swarm intelligence, which people definitely do not have, um, you described like the reasons that we study this as being kind of ways which we can transform swarm intelligence to other things like studying the brain or uh, creating complex robotics. So I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit more about how we are learning from swarm intelligence. So like uh, in, in robots, for example, it has been proved that it's better, instead of having one big robot that is very powerful, it's better to have a lot of them that are very, very simple, but they know how to communicate to each other and they know how to adapt to the environment. So they use ants because ant, ants are very, very simple. They follow very simple rules. So they, they apply those <coughs> rules to the robots and they are able to create a swarm, you know, a swarm of robots that are able to construct things and that are able to solve problems. And for neurons, it's similar. It's very simple cells, but they can communicate to each other, so they produce that intelligent behavior. And so is there like a robotics lab that has like an ant specialist on hand and says, like, bring in the ant people? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> there, there are, there are. Actually, like a month ago in Stanford, in America, they created five robots based on ants. Each robot was only 70 grams, so it was very, very small robots, but they know how to work together, and they were able to move a car that was two tons, so thanks to the cooperation. So it's actually their labs where they use the, la they use the ants to make robots. Oh, I was just going to say, I mean, that's really interesting. I mean, are you into ants? I mean, you know, <laughs> ants are amazing, and you've, you've conveyed that really nicely. Uh, have you always been into ants, or did you have a Damascus moment, you know, a moment with ants, you thought, whoa, this is where I want to be? 
you are, you are asking if, if, sorry, I, I don't see if fast. I understood. I'm so sorry. sorry. Um, did you have a moment where you suddenly fell in love with ants? Yeah, <laughs> and it's, it's kind of a <laughs> weird moment. It's, it was in my master, I got the chance to do a project uh, that was about pesticides. So it was about killing ants, actually. <laughs> this is my dirty little secret, but it's when I discover, you know, how they work, how, they, how the, the nest, how the colonies work. So that's when I fall in, in love with them, when I was killing them. So then I, I felt a little bit guilty. That is, that is true romance there. Please, uh, one more time for our right royal Spanish winner, Alba Aguillon. Just as long as she's learned not to try and love them twice as much tomorrow as she did yesterday. Uh, last but one and longest but one in terms of journey is our South Korean fame labber. I know, I'd have thought Korea was further than South Africa, but I've checked, it isn't. And the other surprise, and it's a big one, is that for the first time anywhere in the 10-year history of Fame Lab International, the winner of a national final was not able to make it to Cheltenham. You'd have thought a free trip to the UK and everything else would have been sufficient incentive to rearrange a diary, but apparently not. So instead, that's presented a career opportunity for the runner-up, Jian Kim. Jian is a student of brain engineering, as their biog puts it, at Korea's Advanced Institute of Science and Technology. She says she has three loves, travel, music, and neuroscience. And she says her goal is to help make science as accessible and approachable as music, so it too can be enjoyed universally. Well, the next step towards that goal comes right now. A big Cheltenham welcome, please, for Korea's sole representative at FameLab International, Jian Kim. Take a sad song and make it better. Along with Hey Jude, the Beatles have created many timeless songs that have been enjoyed by people from all over the world for over, a, over half a century. Well, we never learned to listen and to understand music, but how do we understand and appreciate music wherever we are? You know, we are from different backgrounds, but we know how to understand music. How do we like the music that we love? Sound is a very complex thing. So for example, the first set of sounds in Hey Jude, is, it travels in a really, really different, um, different wavelength. And each of these wavelengths is followed by another set of wavelengths and another that complements each other. So because of this complexity, when it's joined by different beats, and different sounds and different effects, such as accents, staccato, and legato, we sometimes can't, it, it seems too much for the brain to process. So let's go back, for example. For Hey Jude, we didn't need to understand what actually happened. What, for he, <coughs> sorry. So let's go back just a little bit and uh, think about Hey Jude. We didn't need to process and we didn't need to try to understand Hey Jude in order to know what it's talking about. This is due to the brain and its response in two ways. First, the brain separates uh, the sounds that come from the nature. <clears throat> Firstly, our brain stem can separate sounds that happen nature, in, in our nature such as the cars passing by, This is a tricky thing to do, as we pointed <coughs> out at the beginning. Sorry. So don't worry, we'll stop in the clock. <coughs> Okay, let me just go back. <clears throat> Rewind. Ah, I've just gone really blank. I'm so sorry. <clears throat> okay, so let me go back to Heiju just one more time. 
we didn't need to understand or try to listen to what Taejud was saying in order to process the music. And our brain does, uh, goes against this chaos of sounds by doing two things. Firstly, it separates sounds and processes it differently. The brainstem that is located at the back of our brains, uh, just going down towards our spines, it only takes in passive sounds, and it takes it passively um, sounds that happened maybe in our nature, such as our cars passing by. But uh, music is different. It's, it's processed by... Um, <laughs> Sorry. <clears throat> <clears throat> music is different because it's processed separately and it's, it's a more active process. Secondly, the cortex that is the outer layer of the brain which process this, processes this music actually makes expectations. These expectations, when broken, give us a sudden satisfaction. When it's recovered, we feel a greater satisfaction and a bigger impact. So for example, if you hear yesterday, all my, you would expect all my troubles seem so far away, but instead we are wronged and peacefully wronged when we hear yesterday, all my troubles seem so far away. So this is how our brain expects something, breaks it, and is fulfilled, and in turn, um, is satisfied. So by using these variations and, um, and at, at the right frequencies, we are able to enjoy music and like music that we love. Thank you. turned into like some sort of Britain's Got Talent yeah. or something. <laughs> like maybe it's like the voice and that's why we've got like the swivel chair. Yeah. That's why we can just be like, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll have her. Yeah. Can I just add on to just one more thing? Um, I, I couldn't deliver the end of my, my presentation, which means because, you know, there's expectations and it's broken and we don't really find interest in things that are too expected or not expected at all. So that's why we, ha we can have these variations in preferences most of the time, and that's why we are unique, and that's why we are all individuals that, that have different tastes. That's what I wanted yeah, to great. convey. Mm. Well, yeah. Excellent, so you, you actually just stole my question there with, with that <laughs> last comment, but I guess, I guess following on from that, do we know why people's taste in music changes over, over their life? My, my father was a massive fan of the Beatles, and I think still is a little bit now, but is much more into classical music than he was when he was younger. So do we have an idea of why our brain changes what it likes? Or in music? slash, why does everyone old like only classical music? <laughs> Sorry? What's, what's that, uh, alternately, why does everyone old like only classical music? <sighs> well, it's also, it's also related to emotion. Um, when you hear something, you expect s some kind of emotion or some kind of memory as well when it's, uh, when it's related to the specific sounds that you hear. When you expect that, you like it. And if you, if you expect it and if, if you're not really familiar with it, you don't like it. But of, over the course of your life, you, you develop different memories and different experiences, and these sounds make different emotions in you. And because of that kind of changes, it, uh, it creates different expectations, and thus you like different music as you go on with your life. Okay, they're here from Korea, so cheer please again for Ji Young Kim. If we had time, I'd pick a fight with Ronnie over the outrageous statement that old people only like <laughs> classical music, which I think is unsupportable at every level. Sorry. And also, although I'm not happy that it happened to Gian, I am almost happy in a way that you saw somebody there trying to remember, because they, the others, they make it seem so easy. This is an incredibly difficult thing these people are doing, trying to talk for three minutes without any notes about something scientific and reach a conclusion is a very tough thing to do. I have a clipboard. I wouldn't dream of doing it otherwise. <laughs> right, so we've now had Iron Man, Beyonce. Um, we've had Men in Black, Dementors. We've had Ants and Beatles. And finally, or Tremi finally, if you forget the other two Tremi finals, which are coming up at 1.30 and 4 p.m., I'll be back. We have our winner from the Netherlands, Bert Vernocker. 
Uh, originally from Belgium, where he helps organize the Science Meets Society Ocklet Salons events, Bert is now a po postdoctoral researcher at Amsterdam University, studying black holes and cosmology in the context <laughs> of string theory. He says his overly enthusiastic approach to science teaching and percussion means his two young children always get more than they bargain for if they ask him any science-related questions. It sounds scary, judges. You have been warned. So brace yourself for the force of nature that is Bert Vernocker. Gravity. The gravitational force. We all know it especially after the first talk. The gravitational force is the force responsible for this apple falling down. We also know gravity as the force responsible for the Earth revolving around the sun. But gravity is much more than a force involving a celestial object. It's the only force in nature that works between any two objects you can imagine. It even works between people. I feel attracted to my wife, my wife feels attracted to me, and while she calls it love, I know it's gravity. <laughs> the gravitational force is universal, we all know it, and still, it's the least understood force in nature. Gravity is Ill, Ill understood because it's extremely weak. Look at this apple. The entire Earth is pulling at it with the force of gravity, yet I am strong enough to lift it up. I win from gravity. The only reason we see the effects of gravity is because they add up. That's why we see planets moving and stars and even galaxies. But when we zoom in, when we go to smaller scales, we lose track of what happens. We haven't even observed the effects of gravity on distances smaller than the width of a human hair. So how can we see gravity at small scales? Well, I'm a theoretical physicist. And for that, I can offer you an experiment in my head. Let's imagine that we can make a system that's at the same time really, really small and has a huge gravitational pull. And why not make that system out of the entire Earth? Let's imagine that the Earth would be compressed and would start collapsing. At first, we would feel that it gets ever harder for us to jump up. Because as the Earth gets compressed, it becomes denser and the gravitational pull at the surface increases. And at a certain point, the Earth will have become so dense that nothing, not even light, can escape its gravitational pull. This happens when the Earth has been compressed to be the size of this cherry. The Earth has turned into a black hole. And this black hole will be the perfect solution for the young parents out there. You can throw in those smelly, smelly nappies, throw in those diapers. You would never have to smell them again. And the boundary from the region from which the smell cannot escape, we call the event horizon of the black hole. And I want to understand what happens to the Earth as it keeps on collapsing behind the horizon. And for that, I use string theory. String theory is a beautiful theory of gravity and quantum mechanics, the laws of the world at the smallest scales. And recent exciting developments in string theory indicate that the entire black hole can get changed by what happens on the inside. And in my research, I study those changes of the horizon to reveal gravity at the smallest scales. <laughs> Thank you. That was that was just that was really good. I love being taken into like theoretical sort of math sort of world without a chalkboard. So hats off to you for that. Very well done. Um, I wondered. This is a question that you might have been asked before, but does it frustrate you when? People always want to know what are the applications for this kind of research. So how is humanity going to benefit from this kind of research? Does that, uh, does that annoy you? You know, how do you feel about those kinds of questions? Um, that doesn't annoy me at all. I think it's a normal question to ask because I always get asked that question. <laughs> and um, so I have different answers for that one. So let me give you just one. Uh, you may or may not know Thomson. He discovered the electron, but he had a device to discover the electron. Did he know that that device would become our television set? Well, sure, no. He just wanted to know how nature works, how particles work. So I would say, let's just investigate and let scientists, let scientists do science 
and applications will come. Uh, so you, you mentioned almost right at the beginning that gravity is one of the least well understood forces. What is the most well understood force? <laughs> <laughs> the most well understood force would be um, the force we call quantum electrodynamics. So this is the force of... Yeah, that's really well understood. <laughs> <That's good. laughs> um, to everybody in the audience, that's the force of electricity and magnetism. They work together, we understand them together. And um, with the theory of QED, quantum electrodynamics, describing electricity and magnetism, we can make predictions that fit experiment up to 10 decimal points. Um, so that's the best theory, actually, we have. Who he means about his kids getting more than they bargained for? Is if string theory and gravity wasn't enough? I'll just toss in quantum electrodynamics <laughs> at the end, please. A gravitational wave of applause, please, for our Netherlands winner, Bert Vernocker. So that was fun, they were great, fame labulous even, and in a more egalitarian society, we just leave it there, give everyone a cream bun and a pat on the head. But the nature of competition is there must be winners and losers, cheers and tears. So judges, you need to choose three from nine to go through to tomorrow's final. There is no ranking. Uh, no overall winner. This is not like deciding the fate of the three world or whether to call a polar research vessel Boaty McBoatface. It is a much more straightforward task. So you need to just swiftly and clinically cull six of these nine people and shatter their dreams. <laughs> Very simple task. Can we send Ronnie, Ariad and Jules on their way with yells, cheers and last attempts to influence their decision? really is an impossible task. I wouldn't know how to, where to begin. Now, while they're away doing their devilish work, we have things to keep ourselves busy as well. We need to speedily select some, someone. The good news is you're just after one name and no conferring. And this year, having been so successful, we're going to try yet another new way of voting. Uh, there is a long history for Fame Lab regulars of failed technology at this point, And this could be a new addition to our book. So firstly, and most importantly, decide on you think who you think most deserves a place in the final. If you can resist the urge to vote for somebody because you're from that country or you once went there on holiday, just on the basis of how good. So we've got a UK person in this Tremi final. We're in the UK. There may be a UK bias in the audience, but you should correct for that. Don't just vote because of hometown loyalty. So voting is anonymous. Even if you're a friend or a relative, they'll never know. You can tell them you voted for your friend. Just vote for the person you thought was actually best, okay? So next, stage two, get out your smartphones or other internet-enabled device. We're going to be doing it via phone. Small moments for rustling of papers as you get out your smartphones, please. Put them on. Make sure they are connected. Now, if you don't have anything on you that can access the internet, congratulations, you've been disenfranchised. And it could be that everybody else is if we can't get the Wi-Fi to work. Okay, so the network, it says behind me, the network is, uh, does it say? It says Cheltenham Science Festival. It's actually just Science Festival. So the bit at the bottom. So look for the network Science Festival. You shouldn't need a password. Now, once you've done that, the tricky bit, as it says there, is go to live.voxvote.com. Don't make the mistake I did earlier when trying it and putting just live voxvote. Live.voxvote.com. Are most of you getting there? Can you make vague mumbles of success? Come on, a bit more mumbling, please. We don't ask much of you. Right, fine. And then enter this PIN number, 66059. That's chosen because it's the only prime sum of a quadratic inverse root with two integers. Now, if all has gone well, no, it's not. If all's gone well, through the miracle of technology, or just a miracle, you should see a list of the nine fame labbers you've just seen. Are you getting that list up? I'm looking more for the answer yes here at that point, actually, if that's not clear. Yes! Yes! Hey! Well, one. Oh, it's a joke. It's not much of a joke. Thank you, judge at next for semi final. Um, no. Marvelous. Is anybody getting to the livevoxvote.com site? 
Okay, and is it saying enter a PIN number? Yeah. And are you entering 66059? And it's not turning up. Okay. <laughs> I'm not sure, but I believe this is technically known as an epic fail. <laughs> right, okay, so plan B. <laughs> well, we might have to. We don't, do we really want to do it by, by, by show of hands? Ooh, that's very undemocratic. We're gonna have to do it. Okay, we're gonna do it by we're gonna do it by applause. Okay, so I am gonna read out. I'm gonna go through the names once just to remind you. This is good. Grand Okay, let's give up on method A. It's fine. It's clearly epic fail territory. So I'll just read you through the names once to make sure you're familiar, so we don't have an advantage to who goes first. And then just applaud for whoever you think should win. Applaud for everybody, but applaud louder for the person who will win. I'm going to force Helen Kirkman to be our judge as to the actual winner is. So I'm going to bring Helen onto stage. Fame Lab manager, Helen. <laughs> so this is going to slightly spoil the kind of mystery later where we reveal who this is. Because she's, she's going to make a decision now, but she's not going to tell me until the judges come back. Okay. So here's the... It's working. Okay, the important thing is you knew we were prepared. You knew we had a backup plan. Okay. So now you're mostly getting through. Okay, Helen, it's been lovely to see Helen. She's just worked away. <laughs> Say goodbye to Helen. Great. So, very simple. <laughs> now that you're there, having caused a mild heart attack, just go and vote for the person you think. As soon as you've voted, uh, you should be able to, you can click to vote to leave the event. I'll give you a minute or so to get there, and then we'll close the vote anybody. And the names may be appearing behind me. I don't know if they're going to put the names up in case that helps, but they're, they're there on your screens. So I'll give you one more minute to vote. Is anybody still not getting through? It bounces you out. You can't even get to the Wi-Fi. Okay. What? We're gonna, what we're going to do is we're going to assume that a random subset of the audience is able to vote and that they represent you as a whole. <laughs> and then we'll try and see if this is looking pretty dodgy for the second Tremie final, we'll abandon it altogether. But let's at least give it a run through once. If it's appallingly undemocratic, find somebody who has got a phone that works, snuggle up to them and try and persuade them to change their vote. No, we're going to do it. We're going to do it by this method and see what happens. And we'll get enough of you. Should it looks like a decent number of people are able to vote? It's just that a decent number of you can't vote. It's not like it's been chosen on any bias. Yeah, some are working, some are not working. It's fine. Okay, just a few more seconds, and then we'll close the vote. Actually, I'm, I'm having. I'm. I'm going to be mischievous here. I'm going to bring Helen back on. I'm going to make more work for myself. We're going to do two things, Helen, just to make the audience happy. Those of you who've been able to vote, don't take part in this. I'm going to trust you. We're going to have, a, we're going to have an applause vote as well, and both of those will count. I think it's the only way to be rubbishly, rubbishly democratic. Okay, so here's the list of nine names again. So we have Lorenzo Pizzuti from Italy. Don't vote yet. We have Nozifo from South Africa. We have Osama from Switzerland. Uh, we have Vlad from Romania, Carolina from Poland, Kyle from the UK, Alba from Spain, Gian from Korea, and Bert from the Netherlands. So this time, we want your applause as I go through the names. Are we all clear? And don't vote if you've already voted, but I can't really stop you. So, first of all, Lorenzo. <laughs> Next, Nozipo. Osama. <laughs> Vlad. <laughs> Carolina. <laughs> Kyle. <laughs> Alba. <laughs> Gion. And Bert. Well, I think that was pretty obvious, really. <laughs> the, 
No trouble at all for Helen there. Helen, thank you. We'll, we'll drag you back onto the stage later to reveal the result. Can we thank Helen one more time for the impossible task? So I could have asked her to reveal the result or results now because the technology one should be in and Helen's own acoustic version should be in as well. But the interest of suspense will only reveal the results once the judges are back. They're not going to be long, but while they're away, we're also going to try something different, something kind of new. It occurred to us that having all these fabulous fame labbers with us all at once was a bit of a waste of a vast repository of knowledge. We just get them on to talk for their three minutes and answer the judges' questions. We thought it might be quite fun to see what happens if they had a chance to answer your questions. Anything as long as it's vaguely scientific. Why is the sky blue? How do magnets work? What is Brian Cox? Whatever it is you want to know, they will try to answer. So can I get all nine Tremie finalists back on the stage, please? Yes, to applause. And start thinking of questions. If you've got a science question to ask them, come on up, guys. There's enough of being polite, Loretta. Get up there. Thank you, Lorenzo, right? No, 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 it's not like, it's not like just because you're on stage first you get to answer the first question. So, if there's anything about science, can we get the house lights up a bit, please? Can we get the lights up a bit, if at all possible? So, who's got a question? Oh, we've got, all right, we're going to go to the gentleman right down there. Gonna get, I don't know if we're going to get a microphone to him, are we? We're going to go right around, oh, it's going to be, have we got more than one mic? It's going to be tricky going back and forth. Yeah, you see what I mean? Thank you all for, thank you all for your uh, speeches today. All very interesting. One question for Nozifo particularly. The carbon nanotubes, you said that they're hydrophobic, so the water goes straight through them very easily. What about the contaminants? Do they block them up? And if so, how do you stop that? Just before you answer, this is interesting. By the way. We kind of imagined this would be your general science questions, but I guess you can ask them about what you've just heard as well, yeah. Yeah, it's working. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, the thing with carbon nanotubes, firstly, is that when you make them or when you prepare them in the lab, you are able to prepare them in various sizes. So depending on what you want to target or what you want to remove in whatever um, ecosystem, you can make them to be the size that you want. So typically, the size of most of these micropollutants is about seven nanometers. So the good thing with the carbon nanotubes, you can make them down to two nanometers or even less. So if they are at a very small diameter scale, smaller than the micropollutants, they can be rejected on their surfaces. But not only that, um, what we are also looking into, because just like your normal sieve that you use at home, when you separate the large clumps of maybe, let's say, baking flour, you are not getting rid of them. They are still stuck on the um, sieve. So what we want to do or take a step further is what else can we add or functionalize onto these carbon nanotubes to make sure that as soon as these micropollutants get come into contact with them, they can be destroyed immediately. But before that can be fully exploited, we also need to look into if they are able to break them down, are they breaking them down into components that are of more danger than what they were before? Or so there's quite a lot of, quite a lot of uh, research and studies to do before we can fully um, exploit this te technology. Thank you. Brilliant, thanks. And a better question than the judges. We're going to go to, we'll just go one row back to make it easier. Thank you. So uh, my question to uh, Osama, the contestant from uh, Switzerland. <coughs> you talked about the uh, emotion of uh, fear. So what is the status of other emotions and why did you, did you choose fear? Is it, is it like the easiest emotion to, to, uh, to deal with or um, the others are the same? And what is the, briefly, uh, the process of converting these results on, on mice to humans, if it is possible? So the, the, the thing is, um, as I mentioned in my, my talk is, when there is an emotional valence or component that is attached to the memory itself, it makes this memory persevere in our brains. And in this case, if it's fear, this could really affect your quality of life, like patients of PTSD, for example, post-traumatic stress disorder. But for example, if you have happiness, such emotion you won't need to delete or get over, right? So that's why we are working more on fear or traumatic memories 
to, to get rid of. And uh, the only known treatment so far which is unsuccessful is exposure-based therapy. So you go to the psychiatrist and you lay down on a couch where he or she tries to make you vividly recall the accident that happened to you, uh, the traumatic event, in a safe environment in order for you to um, relearn that there is no need whatsoever to be afraid again. Uh, and um, this is exactly what we do with the animals. And we see that it's quite successful if we are doing this kind of physical exposure therapy with them on a regular basis. But then if they are not receiving this training for a period of time, the fear comes back again. And that's why we thought of using a specific drug that enhances the learning, the safeness learning or extinction learning. And uh, probably we can extrapolate it afterwards to try it on higher primates and then humans. I want to leave it there because I want to go in a couple more because we're very tight for time. Short answers panel, by the way. Let's go right to the very back. Um, my question is also for the, uh, the person representing Switzerland. Oh. So um, I was just wondering, to what extent is uh, an emotional memory different from a reflex, uh, like a reflex arc? So when you were talking about putting mice into a bo into, into, into a new environment. Um, it's probably more of a, uh, it's, it's a reflex for them to uh, investigate the new environment. And it's a reflex for them to, um, to not, uh, if, 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 if they're given an electrical, like, you know, if, uh, yeah, you mean, so a stimulus, thank you. So to as you what can. extent is that different from an emotional memory? So the, uh, the paradigm that we are using that I mentioned in my talk, it's called contextual fear conditioning. So we want them to create an association between the context that normally they don't have any problem with it because they, before giving them the shock, they were exploring it moving everywhere. But once we give them the electric shock there, they built an association between the shock, which is a harmful cue, and the context itself. So uh, there are other uh, uh, fear conditioning paradigms that you could use and you can pair the shock with the sound, for example, so they will only freeze when they hear the sound and not for the context whatsoever. But anyways, we have controls. So animals that don't receive the shock in order to make sure that they are not afraid of the context. Okay, thank you for trying to do that. Okay, we're gonna go to middle of that row there. Hang on, hang on, microphone's coming in on your right shoulder, right shoulder. Wormholes in space, fact or fiction? Okay, wormholes in space, fact or fiction? Okay, wormhole are uh, things that actually could be exist in our universe. Basically, theoretically, if you take the famous Einstein equation, you solve the Einstein equation, you find that you have actually a wormhole that connects two parts of the universe, or actually also two universes. But in the reality, we aren't able to see if these wormholes are actually around us. If there are, are in region very far from us, that could we for now uh, not uh, um, analyze, let's say. But theoretically, uh, consequences uh, of this beautiful theory, the general relativity, that is well tested to work in our world, in our solar system. So why it could not be? If it works here, maybe. Okay, so just to sum up, not sure, right. <laughs> One more. Who's got a nice, nice finishing question? Okay, got one there. Wherever you've been pointing. Oh, here. Fine. I couldn't see where they are. Okay, not there. Uh, general question to anyone. Uh, so, is it gravity is a pulling force or a pushing force? So, is an apple falling down? Is it because something is pulling it, or is it because the space time is pushing it? Okay, the microphone is strangely attracted to Bert for this one. <laughs> well, there are different ways of describing it. So one is with space-time, another is with Newton's force, for instance. But the best way of seeing it is not that it's something that's pulling at the apple. It's just a force that works between any two objects. So the Earth is pulling as much at the apple as the apple is at the Earth, yes. Okay, okay and, and I think Can I, is Is gravity a force, strictly speaking, but... <laughs> yeah. Sure it is. We, c we can describe it with space-time, but it's also a force. The space and time around us are the form the gravitational field, and the force is variations of the field. And in the same way, um, electricity and magnetism are described by changes in an electromagnetic field. 
So both of them are forces in the same way. Okay, we've reached the point where the panel has become self-sustaining. They're just going to ask each other questions and feed on forever. So we, we better stop them there. But I think as an experiment, that probably worked better than the voting. So can we please thank... No, no, we're going to stop it there. We've got to because... There'll be, there'll be other Tremi finals. You can ask questions then. But can we please for now thank our nine fame labbers. <laughs> stay there though, stay. Stay, stay, stay. The moment of judgment is at hand. The judges are back with us. See if I can get them back on the stage. Please, can we get the judges back to some applause? <laughs> also, at some point, I'm going to osmotically figure out who the audience winner is. I'm not quite sure how, but Helen's going to tell us one version of that as well. So past experience has shown us it is more dramatic to get the results from the judges first and then find out if the audience are in concurrence with them as well. So, Ronnie, I don't know who wants to say what or how, but before you name names, maybe a bit about how you've reached your decision and what you saw and heard from all our amazing fame labbers. Uh, well, we walked out of the door, and our lovely British Council colleague, Tim, had a very sympathetic expression on his face. So I think it was kind of indicative of the fact that it was pretty difficult. Um, so... Um, just to say, you know, we said that we judge on three criteria, content, clarity, and charisma. And Erin's going to say a bit more about the way that we weighted, like, the way that we looked at that. But certainly on the charisma front, you've all got at least, like, three in your fan club. And we've all got <laughs> heaps of questions we wanted to ask you. And we were, you know, looking evilly at Quentin as he edged towards you. Because we're like, no, 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 we want to know more. Stay, stay. So uh, it was honestly a huge privilege to listen to you all. And uh, I, for one, will be coming at you with questions after this. Guys, you, you don't need to applaud yourselves. You're the subject of the applause. It's okay, <laughs> fine. Oh, just the, um, one of the things that kept coming back in our discussion was it was sort of fascinating to see the diverse ways um, that you all use to explain very varied and very complicated scientific concepts. And so we really... Um, one of the biggest things coming up was how we, how we balanced out this, this content and this explanation of content and, and the performance. Yeah, and just to add, I mean, you know, obviously it's... We've all been there st st trying to communicate science and trying to sort of get across quite complex ideas. And, you know, that's how you do it. You know, definitely how you do it. But also you, the way you answer the questions, which is another quite difficult thing in front of all of you guys, uh, you were really, you know, succinct. And again, just weren't... No one looks spooked, you know. <laughs> Not, you know. So that's that's Seemed genuinely disappointed. amazing. <laughs> well, a little bit, yes. You know. No, Not no, you know, well done. Genuinely amazing, amazing. Okay, you mentioned the kind of Britain's Got Talent or whatever. This is not Britain's Got Talent or Pop. We're not going to spin it out indefinitely. Who are your three going through to the final? You get a drum roll. Okay, so uh, we... Uh, it almost came to blows. It was really tough. Um, but uh, going through to the final from all three of us, uh, unanimously, will be the candidate from Spain, Alba. Whoa. Step forward. Uh, the amazing candidate from Poland, Karolina. <laughs> and um, going through also to the final is the... Drum roll? No? Drum roll. Um, <laughs> <laughs> candidate from South Africa, Nazipo. Whoa! Wow, congratulations to one third, commiserations to two thirds, but hang on. Are there six people going away or are there fewer? That comes down to the two audience votes. Judges, you missed something. It's all got very complicated, but there, no, <laughs> there could be as many as two audience winners on top of this as well. So, Helen, if I can get you on stage, I think you're going to do a double reveal, are you? Yeah. Has anyone got a microphone for Helen? That might be useful. So do you want to start with your own acoustic test, or do you want to start with the amazingly successful technology? I will start with the amazingly successful technology, if I may. So the total votes cast for the Vox vote were 53 that we've collated, and I'm pleased to say that the winner of the audience vote is Lorenzo from Italy. Hey! <laughs> Lorenzo as well. And as a small piece of trivia, that is the first time in the history of audience and vo judges voting that we've actually had somebody sent through in this way <laughs> since the very first Fame Lab final, where the eventual winner of that final was the one chosen by the audience. So that might be a good omen or not, we don't know. And 
And the winner from the highly scientific clapometer. <laughs> I have conversed with my colleagues backstage um, who have also come to the conclusion that going through will be Kyle Evans. Whoa! Yeah. Well, that is astonishing. Where there was a possible maximum of four going through, five from nine. It was, hard, it was hardly worth it, really. I mean, half, over half of you are still going through. That is brilliant. So can we please, first of all, can we thank our judges again for their excellent work? <laughs> can we commiserate with our four runners-up? But remember, you're now free. You can enjoy the rest of the festival, whereas these guys have got to work. So, but well done. So we should also thank Helen and everyone backstage as well behind this event. We should thank the British Council and NASA for backing us. I won't go into all the names now because we're going to do this all again, only different at 1.30. All new fame labbers from all new countries. Well, old countries, but different ones. Thanks for coming and hope to see a few of you then. <laughs>